Chapter 28 The Old Warrior Nothing Uzi might have said could possibly have prepared Ari for the little gnome of a man who answered to his knock a few hours later. A very round, wrinkled face, topped by unruly white hair and punctuated by the brightest of blue eyes, peered out through the doorway and sized up Ari in one glance. "'Come in, come in,' came the hearty greeting in barely understandable English and the thickest of accents. "'You must be Ari Thalberg. I've been expecting you. I'm Yaakov Kimchi. Welcome to Israel.' Ari felt his hand gripped in a bone-tingling handshake. The man was a bundle of energy with the enthusiasm and strength of someone thirty years younger, and his smile was contagious. For the first time since boarding the plane, Ari felt his pain-ridden defenses relax in a very slight yet discernible way. This infectiously happy man was a new breed in Ari's life, a man he liked and trusted instinctively from his first greeting. Sensitive and responsive to Ari's somber mood, Yakov put a hand gently on Ari's shoulder as he entered the apartment. "'You've been through a horrible ordeal. It's been on the news.' P.L.O. attack at Orly. Disgusting. I understand that was your flight. Ari nodded. Yeah, my, uh, girlfriend, we just had a son that I've never seen, was there to see me off. She was killed. I'm so sorry. The deep sympathy in the old man's voice and eyes was obviously genuine. I'd rather not talk about it, added Ari. You probably know more about it than I do, anyway, from watching the news. I've killed a few terrorists in my day, quite a few. It's a terrible thing to have to kill someone, mused Yakov, then seemed to shove the past back into its niche in his memory and abruptly returned to the present with that bright smile. You'll like it here in this rebuilt section of old Jerusalem. No happier place to live in the whole world. I could think of a few, responded Ari glumly. But here I am, and very grateful to you for taking me in. "'Well, let me show you the place, such as it is,' chirped Yakov cheerily. He led Ari down a short hallway. It took off from the tiny entry that opened onto the living room in the other direction. "'It's not a large apartment,' went on Yakov, "'but it's comfortable, and you can't beat the location.' There were two bedrooms off the narrow hall. Yakov pushed the first door open. "'Here's your room. It's about the same as mine. A place to sleep and think.' Drop your bag in there and we'll go on. Not expecting much, Ari peered inside. Opposite the single bed stood a small desk and chair under a long, narrow window. One needed to stand on tiptoe in order to see out of it, which was just as well, since it looked straight at the cracking, bare stone wall of an adjoining house about two feet away. At the foot of the bed was an ancient wooden clothes cabinet, and beside it a small, four-drawer chest topped by a mirror. It would do. "'Home, sweet home,' said Ari graciously, dropping his bag onto the floor. "'Thanks again for taking me in. You're very kind.' "'Not much closet space,' admitted Yakov apologetically. "'But you're welcome to half of the coat closet in the entry. "'This is more than I need right now. "'Everything I have is in this small bag. "'They're supposedly shipping my other things. "'But I won't hold my breath.' The tiny kitchen boasted an adjoining eating area, and next to the table, a small window that looked down on a narrow cobblestone street below. "'It's all yours, just as much as mine,' said Yakov generously. "'We'll split the expenses.' "'Sounds good to me. I just hope I can find a job.' "'You'll find one. There's always room for a good man who isn't afraid to work. Now, how about a drink? I just made some lemonade. My granddaughter brings the lemons up fresh from the kibbutz near the Sea of Galilee.' Sounds great. Drink in hand, Ari followed Yakov back through the tiny entry hall and into the living room. Sit down and relax for a moment, said Yakov, motioning toward a sofa that faced a large picture window. He seated himself in an ancient wooden rocker nearby, which also faced the window. This is my favorite spot, he added with evident satisfaction. How's that for a view? There, spread before his eyes, Ari had his first glimpse of Temple Mount, but from a different angle than he'd ever seen it in pictures. Down below, at the western wall, the faithful were in clear view, bobbing up and down in the fervor of earnest prayer. Just beyond and above them towered the soaring dome of the rock, its golden cupola dominating the skyline. The last rays of the setting sun gave it a soft, ethereal sheen. 
Jerusalem the Golden. He'd heard the phrase somewhere. Ari felt compelled to get up from the sofa, where he had just seated himself. Lemonade in hand, he walked over to stare out the window in speechless awe, overwhelmed by his first sight of the Temple Mount, topped by that golden dome. "'I'll be in Jerusalem before you,' he murmured under his breath. "'What could it possibly mean?' Ari sighed and turned back toward Yaakov. Listlessly, he listened. "'What makes Jerusalem so impressive is the history behind everything here.' With that brief introduction, Yaakov launched into Ari's education in things Jewish in general, and Israeli in particular. It was a process that the old Zionist would pursue with an almost fanatical fervor in the ensuing months. "'There's a big rock inside, directly under the dome,' explained Yaakov. "'That's where the Arabs say Abraham offered Ishmael. "'They claim this land was promised to him and to them as his children. "'In fact, it was Isaac who was offered by Abraham on that mount. "'Moriah, it's called, which is why Solomon built the original temple there. "'And it was to us, the Jews, Isaac's descendants, not the Arabs, "'that this land was promised by God.' "'Ari's attention focused briefly.' You really believe that chosen people stuff? Yaakov smiled. He had met Ari's kind before, lots of them in Israel. Of course, history proves it. Our people lived here for centuries before they were carried away to Babylon for their sin against God, exactly what the prophets warned would happen. The prophets also said that one day God would bring his people back to their land. And here we are. "'Religion's off-limits to me,' said Ari, half-apologetically, hoping not to offend Yaakov, but wanting him to know. "'Impossible,' replied the old man with a twinkle in his eye. "'Religion is what the conflict in the Middle East is all about.' "'Really?' Ari's question was half-hearted. "'How could this tiresome old man carry on so incessantly?' "'Sure,' he added, trying to show some interest. "'There's the Islamic fundamentalists and the Orthodox in Israel, "'but they're fringe elements.' How could the Middle East conflict be all about religion? Bothers you for religion to be that important, asked the old man perceptively. He leaned back in his rocker and laughed. Let me prove it to you. Even the Quran, all through it, in fact, in Surahs 5, 20 through 21, 10, 91 and 94, 17, 103 to 104, and other places, admits that this land belongs to Israel. Yet Islam teaches that Allah gave it to the Arabs. So the very existence of Israel makes Allah a phony god and Islam untrue. Unless the Arabs can put an end to the state of Israel, Muhammad was a false prophet. That's how high the stakes are. And any talk about peace that ignores the challenge that Israel's very existence poses to Islam is dishonest. Maybe, conceded Ari reluctantly, I don't deny that religion has a role— at times, perhaps even a major one, but I still think you're making it much larger than it really is. You'll understand better after you've lived here a while. Ari returned to his seat on the sofa. They sat in silence for a few moments, sipping the ice-cold lemonade. Again, Ari's gaze was drawn to the magnificent and intriguing panorama. Refresh my memory. What else makes the Dome of the Rock so important? asked Ari at last. From that rock under the dome... Arabs say Muhammad ascended to the seventh heaven on a winged horse with the face of a woman. I remember now, but isn't his body buried in Mecca? No, in Medina, in Saudi Arabia. So, if he went to heaven, he left his body behind. I don't think that matters to a Muslim, does it? There's no logic, which is why I avoid religious quibbling. You're right. If it were a matter of logic, Muslims would abandon Muhammad for Christ— he resurrected and went to heaven bodily, leaving behind an empty grave. Ari noticed the old man watching him closely through half-closed eyes. Surely an Israeli war hero couldn't possibly be a follower of that despised Christ. Was Yaakov testing his reaction? It was too soon after Nicole's death to endure this conversation. Ari felt like telling Yaakov to shut up. Then again, maybe a good discussion was just what he needed to get his mind off the immediate past— he decided to opt for the latter, but to avoid any reference to Jesus. Nikki's death and her belief were still too raw. I guess that site right in front of us is central to your religious conflict thesis, suggested Ari. It's sacred to the Israelis because that's where their temple was, but now the Muslims claim it's sacred to them because of the Dome of the Rock. 
Is it built right where the temple used to be? That's a matter of controversy. As you look at it right now, I think the temple was to the left. Yaakov stood up to point. Three temples, actually. Solomon's original, then the one that was rebuilt by Ezra after the return from Babylon, and finally Herod's temple. That's the one we know most about. The old man was gesturing enthusiastically now. Obviously, this was a subject that he enjoyed immensely. Down there, where you see the people praying, continued Yaakov, men on the left, women on the right, that's the wall that Herod built to support the landfill when he expanded the mount to make room for his enlargement of the temple and its grounds. That temple was destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans, and the caliph Abd al-Malik built the Dome of the Rock in the 7th century, hoping to attract Muslim pilgrims to it instead of to Mecca after a rival caliph had captured Mecca and destroyed the Kaaba. I thought they built it because Muhammad, like you just said, had been there. Something about al Yaakov shook his head vigorously. al it means the farthest place of worship, is mentioned in only one verse in the Quran, Surah 17.1, it's the place Muhammad supposedly journeyed to from Mecca on his magical horse. But al was never connected with Jerusalem, certainly not when that was built. Surah 17.1 is missing among the many verses from the Quran inscribed inside the dome. Get an Arab guide and go in there and ask him to find Surah 17.1, and he'll tell you it isn't there. That's odd. Ari got up from the sofa and joined Yaakov at the window again. Actually, it isn't odd at all. Jerusalem was never considered sacred by Muhammad, nor by any Muslims for 13 centuries after his death. No Muslim ruler ever used Jerusalem as his political capital, or even as a religious or cultural center, even after Islam had conquered this entire region. You know, not too long ago, Jordan controlled Jerusalem for 19 years, and the Saudi monarch never visited even once. Then why do Muslims consider it so sacred today? Because of a very clever lie. Yaakov's eyes gleamed with just a trace of anger. In the 1920s, Yasser Arafat's uncle, Haj Amin al-Husseini, spread the myth that the Dome of the Rock had been built over the fabled al -Aqsa. He popularized this lie in order to increase his own importance as the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, and especially as a means of recruiting Arab support for the removal of any Jewish presence in the holy city. I remember vaguely. He fled to Germany, didn't he? Yaakov nodded. He was pro-Hitler and told the Arabs, Kill the Jews wherever you find them. This pleases God and religion and saves your honor. Incredible. Sounds like Hitler. Exactly. And don't forget, Arafat and most Arab leaders still subscribe to the same creed. That baffles me, remarked Ari gloomily, reminded of his own identity now with these despised people. Why the Jews have been so hated throughout history. It's incomprehensible. I've lived through a lot of that hatred, said Yaakov quietly, and there's only one explanation. Ari's attention was riveted at last on the old man's wrinkled but bright face. It was marked by a passion and a conviction that promised the answer Ari desperately needed. Slowly, Yaakov enunciated the words, Like I already said, the Bible calls the Jews God's chosen people. That's why they're hated. As simple as that, smiled Ari indulgently. You really believe that, don't you? I didn't used to, because I didn't believe in God. But I've lived through four wars right here in Israel, and I've seen events that you'd have to call miraculous. Such as, queried Ari pointedly, Yaakov looked at him with compassion and understanding. I know what you're thinking. I was a skeptic, too. I'll just tell you the first miracle, the one that got my attention. A company of Haganah that I was commanding was about to storm an Arab position. Suddenly, a wind blew across the no-man's land right in front of us. It was so strong and stirred up such a sandstorm that we couldn't move. It only lasted a minute, then stopped as suddenly as it had begun. And there in front of us we saw dozens of mines exposed, the sand that had covered them completely blown away. If it hadn't been for that wind, the mines would have wiped us out. A lucky coincidence, suggested Ari with a cynical smile. Yakov burst into a quick, good-natured laugh. 
I know dozens of similar stories, incredible events that defy normal explanation and that saved Jewish lives. These incidents are talked about with awe in the Israeli military, but are not publicized. They convinced a lot of us who fought in the wars that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was fulfilling his promises to his ancient people in a peculiar way at this time in history. Ari made no response. He continued to stare out the picture window at the Dome of the Rock, now fading in the gathering dusk. There was intriguing mystery here that he'd enjoy investigating some day, but it was too much to be confronted with all at once. It was difficult enough to face his Jewishness without this fervent Zionist so persistently hammering away at the religious implications. Finally, Yaakov broke the silence. I saw the world look the other way during Hitler's attempt to exterminate the Jews, and now I see the same attitude. It isn't just the PLO charter that demands the destruction of Israel in the name of peace. The spirit of Hitler lives on in the cries of Arab leaders for a holy war to exterminate Jews. That call to arms screams daily from mosques and from political forums throughout the Arab world. Yet pressure grows for Israel to give back land it took in self-defense in order to create a Palestinian state that the Arabs have sworn to use as a launching pad for the destruction of Israel. Watch what you're saying, protested Ari. You're getting into politics, and that's my field. The discussion had taken a more comfortable turn, and he decided to jump back into it. The Jews forced the Arabs to leave and then took over their land and houses. That property has to be given back. Where did you hear that? It's common knowledge. The patronizing tone was obvious. I was there, said Yaakov, his face suddenly flushed with anger. There may have been a few incidents like that, but I can tell you as an eyewitness that we pleaded with our Arab neighbors to stay, and so did the Israeli government. Ari could scarcely contain a skeptical smile. Yaakov faced him now, eyes blazing. I'm giving you the facts. You read about it, but I lived through it. The truth gets suppressed, and the world seems unwilling to hear it. I remember seeing notices placed on doors of businesses, homes, mosques, saying something like, We begged our Arab neighbors to stay. This is not our property but theirs. Keep it safe for them until they return. Discomfort was plainly written on Ari's face. How could he respond to this man who had lived the history that he had only read about? There was no doubt that he had taught second-hand versions, and apparently, unless Yaakov was lying, which seemed unlikely, some perversions with rather glaring deficiencies. There's a lot of prejudice out there, Yaakov continued heatedly, and it's not easy to correct lies once they've been widely published and accepted. We didn't want the Arabs to leave, but they did, about 450,000 of them, most without ever seeing an Israeli soldier. I'm not arguing with you, countered Ari cautiously, but what you're telling me doesn't make sense. Why would they leave? Arab High Command radio announcements, day and night, warned them to get out temporarily for their safety. Seven Arab nations were going to attack. The Jews would be driven into the Mediterranean, and the Palestinian Arabs were promised that in a few days they could all return to their homes and farms after the new state of Israel had been eliminated. That makes sense, admitted Ari, and instead tiny Israel won a stunning victory against impossible odds. Impossible is an understatement. Yaakov was grinning again. I was there, and I can tell you it only happened because of a lot of miracles. What about the hard work, bravery, and Jewish ingenuity, demanded Ari? Isn't the saying, God helps them who help themselves? I'm not taking anything away from the bravery of the men and women I fought with. Yaakov was silent for some moments, seemingly lost in his memories. Ari waited. He was so talkative, but one had to respect this old warrior, one of Israel's most famous heroes. Wasn't that how Uzi had put it? He certainly avoided taking any credit himself. Back to what we were talking about, this whole Palestinian problem, said Yaakov at last. You can imagine the disillusionment and anger among the displaced Palestinians when the promises of the Arab high command turned out to be so much hot air. At first they were angry with their own leaders, but the lies that were told eventually turned that anger, and the anger of the whole world, against Israel, as though it were our fault that the Arabs attacked us and we had to defend ourselves. 
"'What about those notices not to take over Arab property?' demanded Ari, turning from the faded view in the now-darkened window to face Yakov. "'Instead, you kept it after all, and you took a lot of land that was never part of what Israel was given by the U.N. partition. Why didn't you give that back?' "'Arabs were welcome to return to their homes, but few did. And as for the territory we'd taken in self-defense, it would have been suicide to give it back.' We couldn't return to the original borders the U.N. had given us. They were indefensible. We were forced to hold a limited portion of additional land for strategic purposes, self-preservation. We knew, and the Arabs kept threatening it, that they'd attack again and never quit until we'd been annihilated. And you fought in that first war in 1948, asked Ari. Yakov nodded. And in 56, and 67, and 73... We had to win each time, he said matter-of-factly. The Arabs can lose and come back to fight again. Israel can't. One loss would finish us forever. You've given me a lot to think about, confessed Ari somberly. I was head of the political science department at the Sorbonne, but I've never heard this side of the story, at least not as well put as you've just presented it. With each new war, the very survival of Jews everywhere is at stake. There was a powerful conviction in Yaakov's voice that gave his statements the ring of authenticity, as though he were speaking for the entire Jewish race, past, present, and future. "'We've sworn there will never be another Holocaust. But I can tell you that without God's intervention we could not survive.' "'Was God on our side when Hitler slaughtered us?' retorted Ari. "'That's how I lost my parents, and I suppose a host of relatives.' aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins that I'll never know even existed. A sad and gentle compassion now replaced the anger in Yaakov's voice. That's a difficult question. I lost many relatives, too. The Torah warned our people that we'd be scattered around the world and that God's judgment would fall if we disobeyed Him. Our ancestors disobeyed, and exactly what God warned about did happen. You can't get away from that. But the Holocaust, protested Ari. It was too horrible. I don't understand, but I know there probably wouldn't be in Israel today a sanctuary for the chosen people to take refuge in if it hadn't been for the extermination camps. So that horror may turn out in the long run to have saved more Jewish lives than it cost. Ari smiled and shook his head. Chosen people indeed, he muttered under his breath. Well, he said aloud to Yaakov, eager to escape from the recurring and annoying religious theme, we've gotten into a pretty heavy discussion before we are really even acquainted. Now, how about agreeing that we disagree on religious issues, and then let's forget that subject. I'm just not interested. Yaakov shrugged good-naturedly. If that's the way you want it. But that won't change the fact that the persistent hatred of our people would have wiped us out long ago if God hadn't protected us. You'll understand that better after you've lived here a while and know what it feels like to be threatened with annihilation from every side. If the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel doesn't exist and doesn't help us, then we'll be exterminated. There's a growing international anti-Semitism that reminds me of the Germany of the 30s. World sentiment is again turning against Israel. You'll begin to feel it, too. You'll see. For another moment, Yaakov stared at Ari as though he were looking into his very soul. Then he switched on a light and headed for the kitchen. Sorry that I talk so much. You must be hungry and tired. Let me fix something to eat, then you can catch up on some sleep. Maybe I'll just lie down for a minute. You can call me when it's ready. Ari started across the living room toward the hallway. At that moment, there was a knock. Wait a minute, Yaakov called after him, hurrying to the door. I know that knock. I want you to meet someone. 